Now I'm going to look at law as one way of encoding, and this is really how systems of domination get made permanent and get passed along. Uh, it is written, and you'll see this in a lot of the Abrahamic religions, it is written that blah, blah, blah. So there's an authority to what men of a certain class wrote down. And over time, that acquires a huge amount of authority and prestige. And of course, originally, these were all oral traditions. In fact, like in the Hindu scriptures, scriptures are called shruti, which means that which is heard or that which is remembered. And so that was written down relatively late. They think maybe around the 5th century, 6th century BCE. But here's examples of different law codes. And so we're going to be looking at how that plays itself out. And not a great deal of detail, but me giving you something. And so let's start with the Sumerians, where you do have a strong double standard around marriage, uh, around women's sexual self-determination, around obedience to husbands, and then also the class distinctions and bondage are encoded in these law codes. Again, there's that relationship between domination on the axis of sex and domination on the axis of class. The laws of Hammurabi, one of the most comprehensive legal codes. Here it is all inscribed on a piece of very hard rock. And so, for example, wives who refuse sex to their husbands are to be drowned. So you see the use of terror in the penalties, the female punishments that are meted out in an asymmetrical way. Males and females treated differently by law. And this is something that also comes into play in the women's mirror, which is one of the law codes of the Assyrians, which were a very patriarchal uh, imperial system. And so uh, the rights of husbands over wives, of masters over servants, and distinctions being drawn. This is where we first see the, the veil being encoded as a marker, not only of female submission of status, a prostitute or a woman of the common people would be punished severely in this code for wearing the veil. It was a marker for a woman of aristocratic or um, wealthy status. And then we've got uh, Leviticus and the laws of Moses. And so there's a lot of um, very strong dissymmetry between men and women in terms of rights over their bodies, uh, the differential in terms of sexual expression. And so virginity proofs are being referred to. We have our oldest mention of stoning. Well, that may not be true. The Mesopotamians might have an older form of that. Uh, headship of the male, unilateral right of divorce by the male, uh, taking several partners, uh, taking concubines. And then when a woman is raped, it's treated by law as an offense against the father or the husband, not against the woman. He receives compensation, compensation that's paid to him. And that includes his slave women. He, he is compensated, she is not. And then you've got the theme of female uncleanness and that lasts longer if you bear a girl than you, if you have a boy. In China, the Confucians come along in pretty much the same time frame as uh, a lot of the world religions, Buddhism, uh, Chinese Confucianism, a lot of uh, things were happening, a Zoroastrian quoting patriarchal law in around the 5th, 6th century BCE. And so these law codes are also, whoops, uh, there's a very interesting pattern we can see across major patri patriarchal systems that I'm going to show you now. So in China, Kung Fu Tzu or Confucius, a woman does not determine anything for herself, but is subject to the rule of three obediences. When young, she obeys her father. When married, her husband. When a widow, she has to obey her son. And here's the same idea from India, from the Manu Smirti. In childhood, subject to her father, in youth to her husband, when her Lord is dead to her sons, women must never be allowed to enjoy her own will. And here it is again from Rome. And this is Cato the Elder. Women should be in the power of their fathers, their brothers, their husbands. Remember all the laws by which our fathers have bound down the liberty of women, by which they have bent them to the power of men. And then here's the real fear. As soon as they are our equals, 
They become our superiors. So we have these kinds of laws also happening. Earlier than that, in Greece, Solon is one of the famous lawgivers in Athens, and he had a special uh, women's police that would go in the streets to make sure that women were covered properly and be obeying patriarchal behavioral rules. This is uh, something also that we see this uh, encoding of the 12 tables of Roman law, which had uh, women under tutelage, which is control of male guardians. They're being held in mano, in his hand. And uh, the father or the husband could chastise them with rods, and he had the power of life and death over them and of their children. So husbands had the sole right to order infanticide of daughters. Of course, they would not do that for a son unless he was disabled and the mother had no say. This was also true in Greece. Uh, women originally did not have the right of divorce, but husbands could bar uh, divorce women for adultery for copying the keys, which could allude either to having sexual affairs or getting the wine, which was forbidden. Women weren't supposed to drink wine in Rome. And the third offense would be contraception by drugs or magic. The, the husband wanted as many sons as possible, so the women weren't allowed to control their own birth. And so these Roman codes, with the influence also from the Hebrew system, bleed over into Christianity. Uh, through the person of Paul and various pseudo-Pauline writers in the Christian Bibles. So wives are to be subject to their own husbands, like the Hindu system, as if they were like God. And men are heads over women, women learn in silence, women do not speak in church. Man is the image and glory of God, but women must cover their heads. And this custom of veiling is something that Paul himself, uh, he came from Cilicia, which was an area that observed very tight female seclusion and veiling, a little corner of Turkey and Syria. And then later on, the third of the Abrahamic religions is Islam and various schools of Sharia law. These are based on the Quran, but they elaborate it quite a bit using the Hadith, which are the sayings attributed to Muhammad. But this is straight from the Quran and there's been a lot of argument over the translation of this passage uh, in the in the Anisa chapter, men are kawamun to women. So men are in charge of women, preeminent over women, managers of women. They translate it different ways because Allah has made one superior to the other. So good women are obedient. As for those from whom you fear rebellion, admonish them and leave them alone in the sleeping places and beat them. And this is considered to be rule number one, rule number two, rule number three, that's the beating them is supposed to be the last resort. If they obey you, then don't seek a way against them. So you have a very definite authorization of male power in that passage. And then they, this is reiterated in another passage. This is actually, I didn't put it in here. This is the second surah. Um, Divorced women have to wait in order to remarry because paternity is, uh, the Quranic law is very much about ensuring paternity. And the husbands have the better right to take them back if they wish for reconciliation. And women have similar rights, but men have a degree over them. So all of this is already pretty explicit, but it goes much, gets worse in following centuries with the hadiths that continue being added for the next several centuries. And so, for example, this one, had I ordered anyone to prostrate before anyone, I would order women to prostrate before their husbands on account of men's rights over women ordained by Allah. So they understood those passages clearly in that way. And Nushu's rebellion specifically is tied to sexual refusal so that she is expected to be available to her husband completely in any way he wants on demand. And so this idea of female obedience being the equivalent of male fighting in jihad. Then we have also the secular codes, which in Europe were heavily influenced by Catholic canon law, which already uh, preserved totally intact the patriarchy of Roman law. It was based on it. The terminology is based on it. But then you have 
in early modern times, this reiterations that even intensify the grip of that even more completely. And so here's Napoleon, women are intended to be the slaves of men. They are chattel, they are like objects that we own. And this is also true in English law. By the way, that Napoleonic law applied both to France and Italy. So there was a phrase in Blackstone that came from Norman law. So we could trace it back to uh, 12th century France originally. Femme couvert de baron, which means the woman covered by a lord. And so this was something that got absorbed. At first it wasn't written and then later it was. But by the time Blackstone comes along, he's been a wife in person, as the later commentator said, and that person is the man. Um, that was in the U.S. Supreme Court, I think. But the very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during the marriage. And so he is covered by her. She is covered by him. And so that means that her body, her property, and her children are all under his control. The minute she marries him, whatever property she has, and happened to many women, he can drink it away, he can gamble away, he can spend it on in brothels. Uh, she can't do anything about it. And if he decides to leave property to his brother or to the other woman, he has total rights over putting if the property came from her. And so, um, but nevertheless, she is responsible for maintaining her children. So you see the extreme injustice of this as it comes along into modern times. And so you've got this whole body of behavioral uh, norms that are enforced by society, by women as well as men, because women who do not go along this will be punished socially. They will lose status and ultimately they will lose survival. So, you know, some of these scenes, I don't even know what's going on here, except we have a woman being uh, beheaded by the king. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot we don't know where there's not a literate system or where there's not a lot of surviving written traditions. But I want to talk more specifically now about female punishments. Because the exemplary nature of punishment, this is a way of terrorizing women into conforming to the demands that are being made on them. This is a scene from Daesh in Syria or Iraq, you know, showing women what will happen to them. And some of these specifically female punishments, stoning, it's not that men were never stoned, but women are more often stoned, drowning, burial alive, and that includes smothering them in mire, which a lot, some of the Germanic tribes did. Tacitus talks about this being done in Germania for, for unchaste women, for prostitutes. Throwing women from the tower, this is in ancient Babylonia, I think, Arcadia, uh, whipping women with raw. And here are our oldest texts in which women are to be burned alive as a special form of terror. And so for Hammurabi, priestesses were to be burned if they opened a wine shop. And there are intimations here that there was prostitution going on in that establishment. So the, impu the purity law thing is really brought to bear here. And so it is also in Leviticus, where if a priest's daughter is unchaste, then it is an insult to the honor of her father, and she shall be burned with fire. The intention here is to enforce female conformity. Now, this last piece is more legendary, and we don't actually have any Egyptian law uh, to this effect, but even this idea that the stories are being told that a man would have his unfaithful wife being burned alive uh, has, says something. So stoning, uh, as I was saying before, males could also be subjected to stoning, but it was especially female fornication and in chastity that was um, the target in, in many of the codes. Here in Pakistan, you've got, because they had sex outside of wedlock, they're being stoned and they're called kari karo, the black, the black woman, the black man. So this idea of blackness as evil is kind of wrapped in here as well. And so a woman here, solo, being stoned for adultery. Where is the guy? Not anywhere in evidence. It was easier to catch the woman. And to uh, her punishment was the main point because they went on sex wherever they could. 
but the women were the point of enforcement. So in modern Iran, you had a convention of the woman would be buried up to her waist, sorry, up to her neck usually. Here it looks like it's just to her waist. And a man would be buried up to his waist. And so Quran, or maybe it's the Hadith, say that um, if they if they can escape, then they must be let go. Well, it's much easier to escape if you're up to your waist than if you're up to your neck. But in any case, the differential in enforcement in Iran is very clear, and even more so in Afghanistan. The victims are overwhelmingly female in a lot of these really fundamentalist states um, in other places, too. So uh, again, burial in a pit. We do have one man in the picture here. I'm not even sure if he's one of the it looks like his arms are bound, so it looks like he's going to be stoned as well. But enforcing the lordship over women, the male control of the wife. And if you break that code, then a horrific death awaits you. So here we have the Daesh zones in Iraq back a few years ago. It looks like she's already dead. The stones have already been thrown. Same treatment in Somalia. This is, again, a Islamist militia controlled territory, and I don't even know where this was, but this stoning is still going on. And that's a punishment, but we have another dimension, which is the female ordeal. And this is a sexed ordeal in which only women are subject to certain kinds of tests. So in the book of Numbers, in Torah, the ordeal of bitter waters. And this was something husbands could force their wife to go through if he suspected that she had eyes for another man. So he would take his wife to the priest with an offering of barley meal and would mix it with holy water sweepings from the floor of the tabernacle. And a curse would be pronounced over her. And so if she was innocent, then this water of bitterness will, you'll be free from it. But if you have being under your husband, gone aside and be defiled by laying with some other man, then you will be caused to swear with the oath of cursing. And then your belly will swell and your thigh will fall away. And the water that causes the curse will go into your bowels. And the woman has to say to this, amen, amen, to show that, you know, she's trying to prove she's innocent. But the power of this curse, you can imagine, women to become ill whether or not they had actually done anything. So in Europe, you have all over this custom in, in medieval Europe of a woman being forced to walk the incandescent plowshares, iron heated to red hot, as a test for her sexual faithfulness or her chastity. So here is Emperor Henry, and this is his wife, and she's forced to walk and not even to scamper quickly across the plowshares, but she's being at a measured pace. If her feet are found three days later to show any marks of burns, then she's guilty. So it's really that deck. The use of fire in, in European cultures for these chastity ordeals seems to go back a very long way. So in India, Rama requires Sita to undergo the fire ordeal after she's been recovered from Ravana, the king of Lanka. And because the assumption is that she would have been raped, and it's probably a true assumption. If somebody carries you off, that's what they're going to do. Uh, the ordeal of water, ducking, and this is something that was done especially for accused witches in Europe. They called it the Hexenbad in German. But you also have, in later periods, the cucking stool, the ducking stool. And so this was something that was more originally a, a punishment for women regarded as whores. And so cucking, this is the, the word coquine in French, means a woman who is not sexually under men's control. She's considered to be sluttish. But in fact, later on, the ducking stool is used as a punishment for women considered to be scolds or witches. And so these, these arrangements were part of the city equipment. And you can see it's an all-male mob here who's dragging her off. This woman is fighting back. They're going to bind her into this, and they're going to lower her into the water, which could be a lake or a pond, but very often was a sewage canal uh, or you know, canal going through town, not clean. And so you see the women. Uh, resisting, 
you can see they have these these lever mechanisms for lowering them and this just sat in town as an open admonition to all women better be quiet better better go along with the program or this is going to happen to you and knowing that you would not only be made to suffer physically but you would be ridiculed by the community so in France, they had something like this. They called La Cabussade. She's supposed to crawl into this little iron cage. They would lower her into the river or whatever body of water. You can see the jeering mob all around her, all men. And you know that some of these women in the sex trade, these guys were their customers. The sexual double standard is re really large here. Um, these women didn't necessarily survive these dunkings. But if they did, they were taken off and confined for the rest of their life. So here is a theater, a public theater, that is upholding supposedly the, the Christian standards of chastity and you know, right, rightful sexual behavior, except that the targets are all female. And this went on also in Russia. In fact, you have the flogging also being used in Turkey. Um, but specifically for women in the sex trade, and you can see that this is a very sexualized punishment, bare buttocks and caning them. And you find this flogging of naked women also going on in Russia. Surf women, one of the reasons for their flogging would be uh, sexual, quote unquote, offenses, sometimes by the very men who had raped them. And you also see unmarried women who were pregnant or had borne children being flogged as a punishment in modern Europe. Also, prostitutes in Switzerland were punished by being forced to shovel shit out of the streets. So the ingredient of humiliation is very strong here. And that was no more, especially in the punishment of shaving women's heads. And so these women are in prostitution, but you will also see this being done individually to women who the community had judged to have to be wanton. And so, you know, this was considered an acceptable punishment. And it takes a long time for your hair to grow out. So this is like a really long punishment. So after the Nazis were overthrown in France, you have a lot of women who often unjustly were accused of being collaborators or of having sex with the Nazis, having their heads shorn, being paraded by, you can see all, all men except for this one girl, paraded through the streets, forced to their knees, their heads shaven, knocked around, jeered at, and otherwise ridiculed. And you can see these guys are having a good time. This is a very sexed form of repression. And this is also something that you will see all male groups doing. In, uh, in Germany, they called them the Mannerbund, the, the men's, the men's uh, unions, I guess you could call it. On um, the French, they called the charivari, where men would parade around, sometimes dressed in female clothing, and actually chastising unmarried women who got pregnant, or uh, sometimes even invading uh, marriages, uh, in bridal uh, parties, and committing sexual offenses against the women. But of course, the best known form of these types of male mob violence is the witch finder and the witch hunts. Matthew Hopkins, The Witchfinder in England, notorious figure, a movie made about that. And so I have a whole vast whole slideshows on this, and you've all heard of this. It's something that there's plenty of documentation of, and yet we're still not systemically educated about the extent and the degree of this repression that went on in Europe over a thousand years, just within the medieval to early modern period or to the modern period, I should say. So here's one of the older images that exist of this from an English manuscript. It's being led not to the stake, but to a pyre. But these burnies continued. They were going on in the Middle Ages. They actually accelerated after the Middle Ages. The worst happened during the Renaissance and the Baroque period. So you have women given horrifically to the flames as a public spectacle and a torture execution that you know people would flock to view not only witches being burned but in english law a woman who raised her hand against her husband even if he'd been beating her for hours even if she was just trying to shield her eyes or whatever part of her body that was considered to be 
wifely treason, and she could be burned at the stake for it. So again, making an example, these punishments, these female punishments are specifically geared toward intimidating the entire female population and not just those who were burned or later hanged or drowned or branded or exiled or imprisoned or fined as witches. You know, this is like a massive level social repression directed not entirely against females, but predominantly against females. It had a very strong charge of sexual politics to it. And this is something you'll see in other Indo-European societies. Here you've got the old black sorceress being attacked by the young noble prince. He's stabbing her. And this idea of evil sorceress, someone whose power is secretly causing harm to distant people without ever necessarily even being around them, but using magic or even just the wrong kind of thoughts that could cause harm. And I don't have a picture scanned of this yet, but there's a cliff in South Africa where women accused, predominantly women who are accused of witches, would be tossed over the edge um, to their deaths. So these witch hunts are still going on in Papua New Guinea, very severe. And these are all male mobs and all the victims are female. And I'm not even going to show you the most horrifying things that I have of that. Um, also in Tanzania, in Uganda, in Kenya, in various parts of Western Africa and Southern Africa. This is a film that's about uh, the witch persecutions now happening in Tanzania, like within the last 15 years. And this man explains that a daughter who asked for her share of property after someone died uh, was called a witch and persecuted so that the property could stay in the hands. Her brother wanted a motorbike and he wanted to sell some of that property. And this is a way in which widows in many African countries are targeted because once their husband is dead, they are thrown out and often they are accused of having caused the death of their husband. And so this is one of the factors that leads to the witch camps that you see in Ghana. And not all old women, but a lot of them are, not all widows, but this is one of the patterns. And there is this element of social control because these women are not of the patrilineage. And when the link to the husband is gone, they are regarded as social outsiders. And basically these women fled and started a refugee camp where they all live collectively because they're just you know, where they are going to go. And so uh, there are attempts at reform that are going on being led in various places by some very brave women. You'll also see children, another powerless group, being attacked, uh, accused in this way. And another pattern in India. And a lot of these persecutions are happening around, among the Adiwasi, who are the um, indigenous peoples that are still around in India. Uh, un, very much under siege. And so the social and the economic pressures that are happening in their society are leading to more and more of this scapegoating persecution of women who can't really fight back. And so this woman survived. You can see uh, her face has taken some blows. Uh, but, you know, their own families sometimes accuse them. They become targets for all the woes of the society they're living in. And this is going on to such a degree that the government has organized educational uh, sessions to talk to the community about uh, this repression and what, what it's, how it's harming society. And this region, Guwahati, is an area that is historically a matrilineal culture. So there's a lot of cross between cultural systems. And we see that in another level on the ethnic basis also with the Guarani Caiwa in uh, southern Brazil, there are Pentecostal young men who are witch hunting elder women. A lot of these are medicine women. And so um, they're being seated with a group of people standing around them and machetes. Uh, this woman was just struck with a machete by a young man who's braiding her and interrogating her, placing their hands on them, shaking them, uh, tying them up with ropes. These are all screen caps from a video that I shared on Facebook a couple weeks ago. And so there is a conflict that is male against female, young against old, but also especially 
the dominant colonial religions, in this case, Pentecostalism, that's allied with a lot of the resource extraction that's going on in the land takeovers of indigenous land against indigenous spiritual authorities. So the name that is used for witch in the Guarani language is Nyande Su, which means our mother. It's the name of the great goddess in the Guarani tradition, a goddess in whose leadership the Guarani people had a millennial movement against the colonization 100 years ago. Uh, the men, and there are some men as well, are called Nyanderu, and that means our father. So these are titles given to medicine people that are kinship terms for people as a term of respect, but here they are being humiliated publicly and threatened and browbeaten. 